Well, welcome back to another episode of Taking the Leap Podcast. I'm your host, Bob Dickey. And today our guest is going to be, well, uh, I guess it's me. Uh, I just want to take a few minutes to give a brief recap of the origin story of this pod and discuss some key insights that we've gathered about the framework forming in this new global economy post COVID-19. So normally I would have a guest on here and be asking lots of questions. And this is a little bit awkward for me because I've never just sat in front of my desk and um, started speaking into a microphone, just kind of opining on my personal thoughts and feelings and things that uh, are on my mind. So this is gonna be a little bit unique first time and uh, we'll we'll see where it goes. So just to give folks a little bit of context on where we've been, you know, we started this podcast uh, a few years ago and uh, I just really wanted to have the ability to continue the conversation and explore topics that I uh, had been passionate about. I had written two books on the, the concept of the changing global economy, how it was impacting work, how it was impacting uh, education, what people could be doing to prepare uh, to have and engineer their life to have success in this new global economy. And my goodness, I thought things were changing post 2008, 2009. That's really when I started blogging and writing about this. Uh, but I was just, I was fascinated with the changing global economy. And man, if I thought things were changing a lot back then, my goodness, how things have changed. Uh, post uh, 2020 and coming out of COVID and then entering the the Great Recession. So I just think it's a a, a wonderful time for us to go back and review some of these concepts. You know, I just felt like the data was clear. This was going all the way back to 2008, 2009, that the world was changing and oftentimes faster than people were able to change with it. Work was changing. Everything from summer jobs for teenagers, uh, blue-collar work, white-collar work, professional work. I mean, did those terms even mean the same thing today as they did in the 1960s when my father was entering the workforce? You know, we were talking about things like the freelancer revolution and the gig economy. You know, what was causing the shift in how people lived and worked? You know, we were asking questions on how people were making these transitions. How were young people planning and scoping out their careers? Uh, we were asking questions about, you know, were there new rules for success? Should, how should we engineer our lives differently based on these new dynamics? Uh, how were mid-career professionals adapting and changing? Uh, what about those folks who were entering retirement? Uh, what was changing with them? Um, why were so many people starting an encore career late in life? And that was a new concept, a new term that you know, wasn't around uh, until just recently. Uh, th- again, these were just questions that we were uh, asking, things that we were uh, diving into, and it, it really led me to write my first book, The Leap, Launching Your Full-Time Career in Our Part-Time Economy. And it led to a follow-up book, Love Your Work, How to Pivot to Your Best Career. I was really passionate about talking about those uh, two topics. So maybe one of the things that you guys have um, maybe noticed with me is that I love to ask questions. Well, this goes all the way back to early uh, in childhood. I mean, I, I can probably pull out report cards from when I was in middle school and elementary school, and I was quite the talkative guy. And I was always talking with uh, people in my elementary school, and my teacher was always constantly moving me around. And um, I, I've seen a, a joke recently where the, the teachers, a student said, well, you can move me wherever you want to, but I'd like to talk. I'll talk to anyone. And that basically kind of summed me up. But even going up into college, Uh, My freshman year at the University of Tennessee, my nickname was Q because I asked so many questions. And funny enough, I roomed with a guy from Alabama, and this guy was a walking encyclopedia. He was like Wikipedia and Quora before those services were even available. Guy had a photographic memory and basically had an answer for virtually anything that you wanted to know. He was full of just, you know, reams of trivia and and, and data. And so it was, it's pretty funny. So here I am, a Yankee uh, from Michigan, rooming with this Southern boy from, you know, deep South Alabama. And it was Q&A. I was always asking questions and Mike was always giving answers. And so that was, uh, you know, I was always a guy that just loved 
asking questions. And this podcast has given me the ability to ask questions from some very interesting people. I'm really trying to interview people who I am interested in learning from, uh, people who are doing interesting things in life, leaders in all sectors of life uh, who might have information. I just want to learn about their business. I want to learn about what they see forming in the world around them, uh, how they are navigating life, well, what advice they're giving to young people. So it's just been a lot of fun. I hope you guys have uh, enjoyed this as well. But, you know, fast forward uh, to today, and, you know, I'm, I'm continuing that. We're, we're continuing to interview a wide range of people from various backgrounds, uh, and I'm asking them questions. I absolutely love it. So here, some of the things that uh, I've been asking them is, you know, just like, what decisions did you make in life? What are some of your greatest successes or failures, and what did you learn from them? Um, if they could change something, what would it be? Um, what else? Let's see. What do you see in the world around you, uh, and how are you preparing for the future? You know, what are the secrets of your success? Uh, here's one that I uh, have been asking recently, especially coming out of the COVID pandemic. But, you know, what are you seeing uh, change in the world around us? What are some of the big changes that you're noticing that you think these are going to be systemic changes that, you know, we're never going to go back to normal? You would think that during COVID, it would have been a great time to double down on the pod, but I was so focused on my family and running and managing my company that I really put this podcast on hold for a bit. You know, so coming out of COVID, I wanted to pivot ever so slightly. I wanted to reach out to thought leaders, uh, again, in a wide variety of industries to get their insight on how they saw the world changing and what they were doing to be successful in leading their companies you know, in this, in this new global economy. Uh, I had continued more questions for him, right? How are you personally changing and adapting? Uh, I found uh, that to understand how a person thinks, oftentimes you need to understand their origin story and what made them, what molded them, uh, what brought them to their current point in life. Uh, so much of a person's backstory, I think, really impacts on how they think, how they act appropriately, uh, their vision for the future. Uh, so what, what did they learn on their journey? What were success principles that they used to build their life and grow uh, their career? You know, how have things changed? Uh, you know, what's different? What advice would they give young people and mid-career professionals? Uh, one of my favorite questions, what books are you reading, right? Uh, where are you learning? Where are you growing? What encouragement would you give people who are navigating all these challenging times? So again, I mean, these are just some of the questions that I found extremely interesting and have found uh, our guests have offered an incredible amount of insight. And so just a quick recap on some of the people that we've been chatting with, you know, Dustin Markowski, the CEO of uh, Power Solar, gave us a great recap of everything that's going on, the green tech and the green revolution space, things that are happening in the, the solar, uh, his background. I and mean, if you guys will remember, he's a little bit of a Doogie Hauser, right? He graduated uh, high school when he was, um, you know, just a, a teenager, I think 13 or 14 years old, got admitted to Harvard, but uh, wasn't able to go there because he was too young and he just has a really, really impressive career. And then we you know, spoke with Drayton Wade, you know, head of product and strategy at Cognitos, and the, he is doing some incredible work in the AI space. He's got his finger on the pulse of uh, the digital economy and the tech sector. He's finishing up his MBA. Uh, at an Ivy League uh, institution, Dartmouth. Uh, so a lot of really cool, interesting things. He's talked a little bit about the changing landscape of you know higher education. Uh, Dean Parker uh, ha had a prolific career uh, in, in the tech sector. He's a serial entrepreneur. Talked a little bit about the challenges of him uh, growing up, the things that he had learned uh, in the realm of business. Uh, another episode, we, we titled it The Hunt. Uh, myself and a group of guys went up in the uh, upper Michigan, Traverse City, and went on a pheasant hunt and just kind of uh, took a look at you know things that we could learn, even just out traipsing through the woods, out traipsing through um, pastures and you know having fun, but also learning and applying those principles to life. Uh, interviewed a good friend of mine, Jim Paulin, who had had a massive heart attack uh, at a business conference in St. Louis, uh, almost passed away. Uh, just by the grace of God and uh, some individuals who you know brought him back to life, uh, Jim gave Jim and his wife gave some incredible insights on how this impacted them, how they see the world a little bit differently, uh, how they're managing through. And I thought that just gave um, 
just some great, great insight and advice for, for people to take to heart. You know, a good friend of mine, Oren Zislanski, who's the CEO of Flock Freight, uh, one of my favorite podcasts. I mean, this guy is absolutely brilliant. Uh, he's working with the Vision Fund. Mashiosi's son is a big investor in, in his business. He's also working with Google Ventures. He's got an incredible deck of investors and the things that he's doing in the logistics industry, everything going back to when he was a little boy and kind of growing up in that trucking and logistics space and how he sees it and how he views the world. Uh, Orrin was actually a, a guest speaker at Davos as well. So, I mean, he's uh, flying in some rare air and some uh, interesting circles. Now, one of my favorite podcasts episodes, it just happened spur of the moment. I was down in Pensacola with my wife on a little uh, vacation, and she bumped into uh, a naval aviator in uh, the elevator, and he was from the class of 1958, Walter Dub Fields, and he invited my wife and I to hang out with him and a bunch of his buddies who were there for a class reunion, the class reunion of 1958. And I just happened to pull my microphones and my podcast equipment out and uh, say, hey, guys, you know, it's not not often that I get to hang out with a group of um, American heroes. And they were recounting stories of Vietnam and North Korea and the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and all these types of things. And it was just fascinating to be with them. And um, sadly, sadly, uh, the guy that I just mentioned, Walter Dubfields, the guy who met my wife in the elevator and uh, invited us up to hang out with them just a few weeks after I interviewed him and his friends. Uh, he uh, slipped and fell in Minneapolis, Minnesota and um, hit his head on some ice and he passed away. And I got notified by his, uh, his family and they were very appreciative of uh, the opportunity that we had to record him. It may, it may have been one of his last uh, recordings it was literally just a few weeks, and I will always remember him. What a gentleman, what an American hero. Uh, that's an episode that if you have not heard, I'd re encourage you to go back and listen. Just great advice from uh, these stoic warriors, American heroes. Um, and that was the uh, Naval Aviators Reunion Class of 1958. And so my hat's off to Walter Dubfields. Thank you, sir, for being so gracious uh, and giving me the opportunity to spend some time with you. And we, we pivoted and we went on to my good friend, Mark Ferrier, who's the, the co-founder of And Capital. A uh, fascinating episode of a guy who's been a serial entrepreneur and did a pivot uh, in his 50s. He's in his 50s and he's starting a brand new company doing something you know, new, unique and distinctive. And uh, he, he was very transparent. He's talked about, hey, it's, it, it can be a little bit scary. Uh, doing these things when in your 50s, right? When you're a little bit older and things are going on. And he, you know, he, he was just really opening up and talking about all that. And I loved his transparency and the, the great work that he's doing. Uh, we talked, obviously, with Kelly Fletcher. She's the CEO of Fletcher Marketing. And she talked a little bit about the, the changes of marketing and public relations and things that are going on. Kelly's been on the pod a couple of times and just given uh, great insights. Uh, she's a phenomenal female CEO and leader doing amazing things in America. And then we took kind of like a hard left turn. We had been interviewing all these uh, CEOs and you know business leaders, and we uh, interviewed uh, one of Drayton Wade's professors at the London School of Economics, Dr. Sajin Gohel, who is an expert on uh, global terrorism and global security. And he gave an in-depth uh interview and insight on what's going on in the Middle East, what's happening in Afghanistan, Iraq, and uh, the entire Middle East post the United States leaving, post the 20 plus year uh, war that we uh, had there on the global war on terrorism. What are some of the risks that we uh, potentially are going to have in the future? And he, he gave his concern how the United States is pivoting towards Asia with the, with the China um, potential conflict there looming over Taiwan. And then, of course, we've got you know, saber rattling and war uh, in Ukraine and, and Europe. And so all of a sudden, focus has been shifted and he gives some really good insights of what we should be thinking about and how we should be protecting our interest and being uh, not losing sight of all the things that are going on in the Middle East. Uh, then we talking about a, a, a hard left turn, man, we go from that episode right into Ron Arnold, who 
uh, is known as the Bourbon Whisperer. And this is a guy who was a you know mid-career professional. He was in the healthcare industry. He was an executive, and he was getting tired of the rat race and decides, you know what? I'm going to give all this up. I'm going to go do something different. I'm going to become an expert in bourbon, American whiskeys, and I'm going to teach, train, and educate folks on this and the craft, the art, and the science of bourbon. And that episode absolutely went viral. I mean, I even got a, a phone call today from a friend of mine who's in Kansas. And he said, Bob, I was at a basketball game. And a, a person sitting not too far from me, just a few seats away, pulls out his phone and was and said, hey, have you listened to this podcast? I'm listening to this thing on, and, and, and uh, this, this is a friend of mine. And he said, it was your podcast. He goes, Bob, I couldn't believe it. It was a guy I didn't even know. And he, he held up his phone and he was listening to the bourbon whisper and he was you know, raving about it. But Rod, Rod uh, did an amazing job. I, was, I sat in awe. And here's something else that you guys probably don't know. But when that episode ended, we continued recording for like another 45 minutes. And I've got some bonus content at some point I'm going to release if he will allow me. Uh, but we talked for another 45 minutes and he gave some really cool uh, behind the scenes stories and things like that. So I'm going to get his permission and maybe uh, drop that in there. But there's some really, really cool stories. Uh, yet to come on that one. Uh, th then we get back to, you know, back to work. You know, some of the things that we were talking about at the top here, Jason Radisson, uh, incredible uh, background, worked with uh, Goldman Sachs and McKinsey, and he's the CEO of Shift One. He was, uh, he worked with Uber uh, in Latin America and then an Uber competitor. And uh, he's doing some incredible stuff uh, looking at how the the gig economy, the freelancer revolution, how to bring technology to the space for a uh, part-time uh, workers and how the whole work environment is rapidly changing. And so he's got some cool technology talks about that. Uh, we talked with Brett Johnson, a good friend of mine, the CEO of Benevolent Capital, and he's uh, intimately involved in bringing professional soccer to the United States uh, and all the things that he's he's learned as a, a former rower, NCAA athlete at Brown University. And then now bringing professional soccer to the United States. And that, that happens to be one of my favorite episodes as well. Then Jeff Wayne, oh my goodness, talk about a story. Jeff Wayne, a serial entrepreneur. You kind of get in a, a little bit uh, of a trend line here of people who are starting businesses, launching businesses, growing businesses, what they see in the world around them. Jeff recounts a story about how his dad basically leveraged everything, their family home, a second mortgage on it. They bought a Super Bowl commercial back in the day, 1986, when it was the uh, Super Bowl down in New Orleans, and it was a Chicago, Chicago Bears that uh, eventually won. I believe they beat the New England Patriots, but they leveraged everything on a Super Bowl commercial, and they launched a family business that became an iconic American company, the Duraliner, the bed liners that you have in, the, in your trucks, and they end of, ended up having an IPO initial public offering, taking it public and selling it, but an iconic American company. And Jeff gives the behind the scenes play, how they literally bootstrapped this together. Uh, it was so fun uh, to listen to that story. And then another friend of mine, Sean Murray, he's the CEO of Advocate Publishing and uh, Printing up in Nova Scotia. And he talks a little bit about his family origin story and how his dad and his grandfather worked in this, in the, in this business. He's third generation, how slowly over time they just keep got, buying a little bit more equity, a little bit more equity until now it's a family run business. They bought everybody else out and all the things that, you know, he sees, um, coming to bear, you know, in the publishing world and the, um, in the print world. And, you know, all these people I've been asking too, uh, you know, what, what one of my fa uh, favorite questions is asking them, you know, if you had the ability to address the American people, what would you say? You know, and, it, and each one of those individuals, uh, an incredible leader, have offered insight into, you know, what they think uh, people in Canada or people in the United States need to hear how they would try to motivate and inspire and, and try to bring a very divided populace and uh, around the globe together to find commonality, to find a place where we've got common ground where we can work on issues to make the world a better place. And so I've really enjoyed hearing each and every one of them, you know, answer those types of things. But, you know, you know, various themes emerged from these interviews. You know, there were common success principles that you started to see emerge and you saw leaders who, all of them, very curious, asking questions, analyzing data, 
making changes in their personal and professional life. Nobody was status quo. Nobody was staying the same. Everybody, their, their businesses were changing. They saw the world around them changing, and they were rapidly changing as well. Uh, all of them were readers and lifelong learners. Now, I'm a big believer that the quality of our life is determined by the quality of the questions that we ask. And you know, in effect, successful people see new information and data that they can leverage. They're looking for these insights that they can leverage in their life uh, or in their business, in the world around them. And uh, oftentimes, who we become and the success that we have is downstream of the information that we get. So the leaders that I've been interviewing are always looking for ways to plug in to get really good information that can be the difference in their life and their business. And that's you know one of those themes that I think you'll see really emerge from these interviews. Uh, all of them are risk takers, but they also know how to manage risk. They're not um, just rolling the dice with a wild abandon um, you know, in Las Vegas, but they understand risk. They're taking risk and they're, they're but they're protecting their downsides. Um, and it's been fascinating to see how each and every one of them views risk differently, but none of them are afraid of it. They all realize that the world's rapidly changing, uh, and that they have to change with it. And that's, you know, very many times, uh, risky. So, um, in January of this year, I had the chance to be back on campus at Harvard Business School in Boston. I got to sit in a couple of classes, and one of my favorite professors is Mir Desai. Um, and I'll put a couple of my favorite books that he's written in the show notes, but I was able to sit in on a lecture that he gave, and the title of it was Finance for a World Turned Upside Down. And his analysis echoed many of the things that we had been hearing from these leaders that I've been interviewing. Uh, one of the quotes that I wrote down, it was, it was amazing how, how he stated it. He said, you could have ignored the financial world for the last 15 years and done well. I mean, we were uh, the, the stock market, the global economy, it was kind of up and to the right. Things were going great. Virtually every sector was doing well. He said, man, you could have ignored virtually everything and still done very, very well. Um, but he said, you know what? Going forward, that's not going to work. You will have to fundamentally change the way you think. And he says, that, and here's the thing that was, uh, very, I thought, very insightful. And he said, it's going to be very hard to do because we get hardwired deep into our mind on how we see the world. And, you know, in effect, the, the frameworks that we have are going to have to be all redone. Uh, I think we're, many of us have been used to seeing these V-shaped recoveries. And the, for those uh, who don't know what a V-shaped recovery is, a V-shape, you know, so you have a, a drop maybe in the stock market or a drop in the economy, but it, you know, after a particular period of time, it kind of bounces right back up. It almost makes a V kind of shape on a graph. Um, and it bounces back to normal. Uh, but that's what, what he was saying is that, that that's not what's going to happen this time. Fundamentally, we're going to come back to something brand new. And because of that, we need to build brand new frameworks for the world uh, around us. The economy is going to be different. There's going to be new market realities. I mean, w w we've seen it. Uh, the entire supply chain basically has been blown up, and it's not fixed yet. We now have a, a raging war in Europe. And it uh, is on the verge of spreading. That's going to have impact on all sorts of things from food production to oil and natural gas and geopolitical uh, ramifications all throughout uh, Europe and throughout the Middle East. And then we have you know saber rattling with China and over Taiwan and the South China Sea and the uh, sea lanes and uh, trade going all through that ne neck of the woods. So we're coming back to a very, very unstable world. We have to have new frameworks, new mental models. Um, so he was just encouraging folks to don't think that we're coming back to a, an economy and the rules of the road that we had in 2019. He said, be ready, be prepared to relook at everything, rethink everything. Um, and we've been led to believe that there's one large global economy and that things generally move in sync with each other. And that's no longer true. There's going to be a large range of possibilities based on your industry. And, we're, and he gave many examples where you would have one sector that was doing very, very well and something that was tangential to that 
um, that normally would be doing very well uh, was uh, in the tank, was doing very poorly. And so you know, he was highlighting, like, we are living in a very divergent time where some things can be unexplainably up, while at the same time, other things will be down. Uh, our past experiences are not going to be able to help us navigate this unless we also change our framework. So I think he was really concerned about people kind of slipping back into this old normality and then making bets on the future, planning and engineering our lives, whether it could be our personal life or giving advice to our children, grandchildren, uh, you know, planning, making plans for our business, thinking, hey, well, this is what, what I've always done. So we're just going to do X, Y, and Z, and we're going to have great success. He's like, man, you are going to get run over by a train. Don't let this happen to you. So uh, Professor Desai implored uh, this large group of CEOs that had kind of gathered there in Boston to be more Bainesian in their approach. Uh, take in all the data that you can, that you can uh, consistently and constantly, but be shifting your beliefs or our beliefs, be shifting your range of possible outcomes uh, by the new data that might emerge. And at all costs, be humble, understand that we don't know what's going to happen, stay close to the data, don't get dogmatic about our beliefs or our, our key positions that we might be holding. You know, going back to some of the things that we've heard uh, leaders in this podcast say is, you know, it's okay to have a strong opinion, just as long as it's loosely held, right? Be willing to change your mind. Uh, many times changing our mind is very hard to do, especially when we've gotten locked into a position. Uh, you know, we all know about the sunk cost fallacy. Once you've put, you know, money behind something, it's really hard to say, ah, oh, you know what? I, that was a bad bet. I need to move on. Uh, but th these are the types of things that we're going to have to do more often in this new economy. Um, so let, going on a little bit, let's see. You know, with all of this said, it's you know easy for us maybe to hunker in the bunker and not take action. It's easy for us to you know say, hey, you know, I'm going to kind of play it safe. It can seem safer and less risky to do anything. Uh, but one of the things I'd like to remind all our listeners to is that a business is an awful lot like the military in armed conflict. And my brother's an army ranger, and one of the things that he you know, constantly talks to me about when I'm asking him questions about, you know, operations or maneuvers or things that he learned in ranger school and things like that. But, you know, they have a, a motto, it's shoot and move, shoot and move. And you're constantly looking to obtain better strategic advantage on the battlefield. You, you do not want to stay put on the battlefield. Your uh, opponent will outmaneuver you, outflank you, uh, and you will find yourself in a position where um, you're, you're, you won't stay alive. And business is very much uh, the same, you know, staying still, being reluctant to move, being reluctant to change, to pivot is a sure way to lose. And so uh, in, in this time where data is imperative, uh, new data, it's important for us to get this new data. And, you know, action, one of the things that we all know is that action produces information. And with that information, we can then PDCA. That stands for plan, do, check, and adjust. And so the more data that we're, uh, we're, we're bringing in, the more action that we're taking as individuals in our personal life and in our business, we'll be able to make plans. We'll be able to go out and execute. That's the do part. Okay, so plan, then we do. Then the, the next series is check. All right, hey, we're going to you know check on the data that's coming in. How's it doing? Uh, then we make adjustments. And that's a, what you, you can create a virtuous cycle there if you plan, do, check, and adjust. And we run PDA cy uh, PDCA cycles in our business quite frequently. I'd, for those of you who maybe have not heard that term, I'd highly encourage you to get familiar with it, implement it in your personal and your business life. Um, you know, another thing that I've uh, been reading and uh, studying and one, one of the people that I like to kind of keep my finger on the pulse on and things that he is saying and doing is Bill Gurley, who is known as one of the most successful venture capitalists of his generation. Uh, and he says one of his, uh, the key question that we should be asking right now is what could go right? You know, it's a, a lot of times I think it's easy for us to sit back and be thinking about, oh my goodness, this could go wrong and that could go wrong. And it's it, we're, we're all experts at looking at and seeing the downside, all the things that could possibly go wrong. Bill says, man, flip that narrative. Start asking the question, what could go right? You know, this is uh, also not the time to be looking for um, quick successes 
uh, to bail us out of maybe previously bad decisions. But, you know, as we're uh, building our companies, as we're you know, making plans and taking action, now, this is a time to have that slow, methodical, making good decisions each and every day, building for the future, uh, you know, in the VC world, right? So uh, Bill's a, a, a venture capitalist. No one's looking at trying to hit a home run in two or three years. People in the VC world that know that uh, those big home runs that we hear about, it takes a while to, to, to get traction. It takes a while to, to incubate these ideas and to slowly build them, right? Those big home runs can come eight, nine, 10 years in, right? Long, slow, methodical, consistent growth. So you know, one of the things that I would encourage folks is there's all sorts of opportunities out there where people will be like, hey, if you just do this, I mean, it's a it's a, a quick home run, quick success. I just have never found it. I've never found it uh, where these, uh, these, these quick successes are lasting uh, and where they pan out over time. So I would just encourage folks to have that th uh, slow, methodical uh, grind and, and mountain climbing. Uh, you've heard in some of the podcasts that I've, uh, when I was with Jeff Wayne, we, were, we do a lot of mountain climbing together and we called it the long gear, right? And the long gear is just that slow, slow, methodical ascent up the side of the mountain that you're cli climbing, you know, keeping your eyes on this, on the summit where you're wanting to go, but you don't rush to get there. Um, so that's something that I think is really important for us today, All right? We have uh, a, also a generation of managers and, le and leaders who have not led in this type of environment. There's a whole slew of people who came in and got involved in business and the, and the, the economy, and it, the world is radically changing around them. And uh, this is going to be uh, and require a different skill set to navigate and engineer and run a business and your personal life, right? So, so what are some of the things that we're seeing? Money is no longer free z with interest rates at zero. You know, this is going to impact families and businesses alike. Families are going to have to ask, you know, how are we going to be able to buy a car if we can't get a 72-month interest-free uh, loan? Like uh, many of these car companies we're launching or, you know, looking to buy a new home, you're not going to be able to get, you know, mortgages at 2 and 3%. Uh, it's all of a sudden, it, it is very different when you're looking at mortgages at 6 7 8%, and that's where we're going to be. Right. Uh, same issues are impacting businesses. Right. So everyone from families to businesses, we need to focus on the bottom line. We need to make sure that we're really managing and uh, cost cutting, making a profit. Uh, running deficits is not going to be sustainable in this environment, both for families and businesses. We all know this. Um, you know, we, we're hearing about these changes every single day in the news and these uh, future outlooks. Uh, and so I've just been wanting to ask our guests, hey, what do you see? What are you doing? How are you learning? How are you adapting? How are you preparing? Um, my dad, I think maybe the, one of the reasons why I, I get fascinated to ask these questions is my dad always told me growing up, he said, Bob, experience is the best teacher. And when possible, leverage someone else's experience so you don't have to learn through your own experiences. And I've always remembered that. So you know, one of the things that I love you know, asking and talking to these uh, individuals about is like, hey, what, what are some of the um, the failures that you've had? What did you learn? Right? What are um, what are some of the successes that you've had? What what have you learned? How how are you trying to duplicate you know those types of successes in the future? So every aspect of society is going to be forced to make changes. Period. Uh, over the next decade or so, we probably have a few trillion dollars of destruction that's going to take place, whether it's in the stock market, real estate assets, you name it. Uh, we've got a lot of sectors that uh, are overvalued, and a lot of that is going to come down, so that's going to have ripple effects. Uh, so those who are making proper changes are going to be prepared in their businesses and their personal finances as this uh, wealth destruction is underway. Uh, but, but in the midst of all of it, instead of being filled with doom and gloom, uh, there's also going to be an abundant abundance of um, opportunity in the midst of all this chaos. And so the key thing for us is to be able to persevere to stay in the game. And I'll say that again. I, you, you've got to be able to persevere in the midst of all this to be able to stay in the game, right? Making uh, just really good decisions. So, you know, these impacts are going to be felt on uh, Main Street as much as they are on Wall Street, which is why I've been asking all these leaders what advice they would give young people and uh, their children in regarding to how to prepare for the future. Um, a recent survey in the United States showed that 77% of all the advertised jobs, over $35,000 uh, a year, required a college degree 
which is interesting because only one third of Americans have a college degree. So in effect, you have two thirds of the American population that are locked out of the best advertised jobs due to a lack of credentials. And that's over 80 million Americans. And uh, so much of our talk on this podcast and with these leaders has been uh, about education and entrepreneurship and potential ways to engineer your life and have success success outside of the traditional pathways. I mean, what happens if you've got, you know, a family and someone says, hey, you know what, I just, I don't want to go to college or I don't have a hundred thousand dollars to spend on college. Is there a way for me to be successful and have success um, in, in other areas? And the answer is yes. I mean, the trades, Oh, there's all sorts of incredible things that are happening right now. Uh, a reemergence of the trades and uh, apprenticeships and uh, entrepreneurship, uh, not just in the United States, but but globally. Um, you know, I think maybe one of the reasons for that is because the cost of education is just out of control. When you take a look at the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, the prices for college and, and tuition have gone up 1,482 percent since 1977. That's crazy. 1,482% increase in uh, higher education costs since 1977. And this is you know, why companies like Google and Amazon have started their own education programs. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is uh, to get out on MOOCs. And some, that stands for Massive Open Online Course. Uh, websites like edX.org and Coursera.org give people the ability to take these courses from advanced education uh, universities, from every you know the Ivies to University of Michigan, University of Virginia, North Carolina, uh, you name it, all you know, all across the world. Take these courses. Many times it's free. Uh, but even Google and Amazon, they're launching their own certification programs, and people can take a few months and get certified in data analytics and uh, programming. Uh, and with that credential, these companies will hire you. So you don't have to uh, you d go through the, the traditional uh, pathways of higher education. It's just it's really interesting to just see how the world is changing. So this is an uh, an issue that's important for everyone, from young people starting out to mid and mid and late career professionals that are needing to reskill. I'm asking all of our guests, how are they doing that? Uh, you're hearing a lot of talk on uh, talk shows and, and media today about mid-career professionals and even late career professionals who are uh, reskilling, going back to colleges. And colleges and universities had kind of tailored all of their, their programs for that 18 to 24-year-old, and now they're creating new pathways for, you know, what, what about the, the person who's in their mid-50s and wants to change their career and reskill? Uh, there's all sorts of new programs being started specifically for that age demographic. Uh, as, as people discuss the lasting changes that will stick post-COVID, one of the ones that most everyone agrees on is that work has forever changed. You know, we have a uh, work environment that's about 150 years old, and that work model, we completely blew up. And we're just starting to understand the true implications of this. You know, in the 1880s, we had the rise of unionization here in the United States that forced an eight-hour workday and a five-day five work week. And virtually every industry in our country was organized ar around this uh, quasi-norm. And if you think about it, you know, globally, you know, an eight-hour work day, a five-day work week, and that's pretty much how uh, the world has been organized. COVID blew the entire thing up. And it's actually pretty fascinating to think about. Uh, remote work is here to stay. Flexible work arrangements are now the biggest things that unions are fighting for uh, in various strikes. It had these strikes that you've seen for rail workers and dock workers and so forth. It's not been about pay. They've been agreeing on the pay. The thing that they're striking about is a flexible work schedules. Uh, people don't want to go back into office buildings like they did before. You know, I just heard a couple days ago that New York City estimates that it's going to lose over $12 billion a year in revenue due to the change uh, in the work environment and more remote and flex schedules taking place in New York City. And as of December, of this last year, December 2022, only 8% of the workforce in New York City is full-time. Think about that. The ripple effects 
uh, of these stats uh, are staggering. So it, we're going to see a lot of downstream um, changes and implications that we really, I don't think, have fully put our finger on. Uh, and it, it, we're, we're just now starting to see how this is all going to change. And so moving into other changes, you know, um, think about the uh, downstream impacts on every industry in the city of New York. Um, you know, we, we're going to need a lot more data on this, but just think about mortgage applications, right? Mortgage applications are down 42% year over year across the country. Uh, we've had 12 straight months of a decrease of home sales in the United States. Refinancing of a home in the United States is down 80%. This is one of the most unaffordable housing markets in the United States history. So how is this going to impact people? How is this going to, uh, this new data going to impact uh, how people are living and organizing? We're seeing mass migration. A lot of folks leaving California here in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. We're seeing a lot of folks come in from California, New York, and Chicago. All right. So um, there, there's just, there's impacts everywhere. Uh, just this week, we heard that the Fed uh, in, anticipates raising rates again, which is going to only further exacerbate some of these issues as mortgage rates are probably going to be increasing here in the near future. Uh, who knows how long we're going to have these trends. And so we're going to have some headwind, headwinds uh, in that sector. But as you have headwinds in one sector, you know, many times it offers, um, you know, some opportunity in other sectors. So what's another, an area we ought to be looking at? Well, think about remodels. So think about Home Depot and Lowe's, for example. Many homeowners have locked in their mortgages at under 4%. They don't have plans on moving because of uh, the prices of real estate are up and the mortgages are up. And so uh, there's going to be a lot of folks who are going to be remodeling their homes. We have over 24 million homes in the United States that need repair. And usually that big repair window hits somewhere between when a home is 20 to 40 years old, right? So that's kind of the, uh, the sweet spot there for major home repairs and renovations. So we've got 24 million homes in America that are in that sweet spot. Uh, now, Home Depot... This last quarter, Q4, uh, missed their earnings, right? And so with that news, instantly, their stock price was down 7%. And, you know, they're talking about some headwinds, and they understand that there's some folks that are maybe, you know, watching their, their pennies, their dollars a little bit. But for me, I'd be taking a look at that and saying, hey, you know what? This seems like a sector I might want to invest in um, because there's, there's going to be a lot, there's a lot of folks who are going to be staying put and uh, wanting to make renovations. I just use this as an example that with all the bad news that might come out from time to time, if you're looking, there are all sorts of great opportunities that we can you know, keep, an eye, keep an eye out for. So um, it's just another example of how we need to have new models built, right? So new models on everything. This is gonna impact investing. We're already seeing major changes in the, in the hot tech sector, uh, the so-called growth stocks. Um, they're going to be less in vogue, right? As more and more folks, as interest rates go up, um, and it all, all has to do with discounted cash flows. And you know, as people are taking a look at those stock portfolios, companies that are producing revenue today, generating income today, a dollar today is more valuable than uh, hope, hopeful um, returns in the future. So people are going to be changing their portfolios, and uh, there's going to be a whole new uh, group of stocks. And investment strategies in this new kind of market dynamic that people are going to be looking at. So that's all going to be taking place, right? And that type of pressure that's, that is uh, being exerted on these tech stocks, but we're seeing what's happening, right? They know it. They don't want to see their stock price uh, negatively impacted. They know that they've got to be profitable. And so what's happening? You're seeing Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, uh, Google, tens of thousands of tech workers are being laid off. Now, think about this for a second. Just a few moments ago, we were talking about um, young people who are trying to make plans for the future, You know, the rising costs of tuition and, and so forth. I can promise you there was a lot of people. There, there's, there's a lot of people who are getting pink slips, are being laid off, 
And a few months ago, they're like, hold on a second. I've got a computer engineering degree. I've got a data analytics degree from, you know, one of the top universities in America, you know, data analytics from University of Virginia, or I'm a programmer from the University of North Carolina or M Michigan. And, you know, I've, I'm working for Amazon or I'm working for Facebook. I'm working for this, um, you know, iconic American company that's doing well. My, my job and my future, I'm safe and secure. Then all of a sudden you wake up one day and that's not the case. So even places where people felt safe and secure, they're finding out that, yeah, you know what? The world can change quickly and it's changing for everyone, not just blue collar, not just the you know, white collar and professional sector, but even in the tech sector as well. So as more and more people participate you know, in the gig economy and others become freelancers and venture out to start uh, a business, as an entrepreneur, it should go without saying that the financial situation today is impacting small businesses uh, at a disproportionate rate. So um, just because you might think, well, I work at a big company. Well, that didn't work out so well for uh, people who are working in the tech sector. People, oh, I work for a small company. Maybe I'm, I'm safe and secure there. Actually, no, you're not, not safe and secure there either because you know small companies uh, are disproportionately negatively impacted by uh, downturns in the economy, uh, rising interest rates, uh, a lack of access to capital markets. Uh, maybe they're unable to get uh, loans, uh, get access to capital. And so small businesses uh, can be facing you know, headwinds as well. As much as I love starting businesses and being an entrepreneur, I know firsthand what it's like and the challenges of running a small business. So think about some of these statistics. So you know, I'm saying all this because there's, there's really not a safe place where you can say, oh, you know what? I'm in this sector of, of society. I'm in this sector of, the indus of industry. I'm safe. Eh, no, big companies, small companies, doesn't matter. The world is changing for everyone. But think about these stats. 51% of small business owners in the United States are older than 55, and 47% of the U.S. workforce is employed by a small business. This represents over 62 million employees, which is the backbone of the U.S. economy. And you know, understanding inflation and interest rates and how this impacts a small business is very, very important. Okay, so. Uh, you're, we're going to hear all sorts of debates, all sorts of things in the news. Uh, politicians in Washington talking about government debt, the needing, the need to cut, you know, entitlements and big government spending. And of course, we all know that these are great talking points. It gets them on CNN or Fox News or other media outlets, and uh, it, they, they everyone's looking for that little sound bite. But nobody is going to want to touch this third rail of being the person advocating making cuts to entitlement programs that a lot of Americans uh, need and rely on um, every single day. But there's that interesting potential way that it can be done in the dead of the night behind closed doors where and when the general public is not aware of it. And it actually happened before. To be exact, it was 1996 during, I believe it was the Clinton administration. And it's going to be done with the manipulation of inflation numbers. So for those of you who are maybe interested in this, uh, th uh, this point, I would highly encourage you to read up on the Boskin Commission. Uh, but in short, it was a commission that was put together with a couple of economists, and in the dead of the night, they came up with uh, this idea that uh, inflation was accidentally, using air quotes there, accidentally overstated by 1.1%. And thus, cost of a living adjustments or COLA, cost of living adjustments. I was used to my COLA adjustments when I was in the military. Every single year, you know, we'd get a little bit of a, a pay bump when you're, in, when you're in government service in the military. And it was called COLA, right? Your cost of living adjustments. But because inflation uh, had been overstated, that these things could be reduced for federal government programs to include Social Security. So over a decade... There's many experts who believe that this readjustment of inflation numbers saved the federal government close to a trillion dollars uh, in entitlements. They were able to, you know, kind of lower entitlement payments. And this is a backdoor way to reduce entitlements without having to go through a full-blown voting process in Congress. So 
uh, over the next few months, as we all hear about you know the ballooning, the federal deficits, uh, all the, the 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 unfunded liabilities that the federal government has, and there's going to be all sorts of little tricks behind the scenes that they will do and implement um, to r- reduce costs. And just read up on the Boskin Commission; it's it's fascinating. Once you go down that rabbit uh, hole, uh, it'll be hard to pull yourself. Uh, back from. But uh, I, I guess I, I say all these things right now. It's just regardless of age, whether you're employed by a company like you know Facebook or Amazon, Google, or whether you're a small-time business owner or retiree, inflation, interest rates, consumer price index, these numbers, understanding these numbers, uh, understanding these numbers and how they're determined and how they're used, it's going to have a big impact on your life. It, it impacts everybody. This is not um, something where it's only going to impact a few. Um, so I, I, I share all that with you. And um, I just I think there's a lot of things that are moving in the world around us. I think it's important for us to be aware. I think it's important for us to have our finger on the pulse of the economy. My commitment to you is that we're going to continue to interview um, thought leaders, people who are doing interesting things, uh, people who in all sectors of society, every single industry, um, we're going to learn from them. We're going to glean from them. We're going to ask them a lot of questions. And hopefully these are things that you're going to be able to use and leverage in your life, uh, in your business, your line of work. Maybe it's going to give you some data points and some uh, things that you can share with your kids or your grandkids. Maybe it helps you prepare for the future a little bit better. Uh, But like every episode, I want to end by giving you a book recommendation yeah, the, the, the book recommendation is going to be uh, something that had just recently been given to me or recommended to me, but it's, the, the title of the book is The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, and it may be one of the most fascinating financial books I've read. Uh, I, I've recommended this to many friends since I finished it, and it's also going to be a book of the month for our leadership team uh, at our company. I think it's important. Even my kids are going to read this. Uh, with, but with everything that's going on today, the, the big question I get from friends and family and coworkers alike is, uh, you know, what should I do to prepare for the future? And these are multiple questions, right? So what should I do to prepare for the future? How should I protect myself? Uh, where should I invest? Um, now, this is where I need to say, hey, I'm not a financial planner. I'm not you know, a financial advisor. Uh, but this book is going to contain a ton of just great information on how you can maybe think about money, how you can think about your investments and uh, areas in which I think it's going to make you a strong, a stronger person in terms of making plans for your life. But you know, a central theme um, of the book is that our financial future is more determined by personal factors regarding our beliefs and our personal habits than it than they are external forces. Uh, we need to understand how we think and behave financially. And how we think and view things like risk and greed and fear and uncertainty and doubt, or fear, uncertainty, doubt, short, you know, for FUD, um, and how our personal beliefs on all these things uh, are going to are impacting our future. You know, do we have good habits or bad habits? How uh, do those habits impact uh, our decisions over time? Um, and you know, being good with money is not about being good uh, with investing or making a lot of money having advanced mathematical degrees or advanced educations, but being good with money is rather all about our personal beliefs, about our actions, our daily habits, emotional control and discipline, Uh, making money and keeping money. This is another topic in the book, but making money and keeping money are two very different skill sets. Making money requires uh, us to have a little bit of optimism. Um, Saving money and keeping money uh, requires a little degree of conservatism, maybe even fear. I've heard uh, other people call it, you know, having a degree of humility, keeping our spending under control and not being obsessed with displays of wealth or keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. Um, the reality is, is that we're going to have to ha- have and be able to hold conflicting views of the future at the exact same time. We need to be optimistic and pessimistic. Uh, one of the most important concepts discussed in the book is how time is the number one aspect of investing. And uh, what made Warren Buffett one of the greatest investors or the greatest investor of his generation was not his intellect, but that the fact that he started at the age of 14 and continued well into his 90s. Um, 
compounding interest works wonders. We've, we've, we've all heard this. We know this, right? But an incredible statistic about Warren Buffett is that 99% of all of his wealth today was generated after the age of 65. Let me say that again. 99% of his wealth generated after the age of 65. Now, this is not a, a quote or a stat to say, uh, well, it's never too late. See, it's never too late to start. It, that, that's a true statement. It's never too late to start. But rather, that stat is actually uh, showing somebody that it, the, the power of compounding and the fact that he was he started at the age of 14. And when you are able to stay in the game that long, allow time to work to your advantage, allow compounding to work to your advantage, you can generate massive, massive wealth. Um, so the key is to get in the game, stay in the game, be there long enough uh, for the, the power of all this to work in your favor. So I highly recommend this book. I mean, it, it is a game changer. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave you with this. I just really think that the key for success in life is to take agency uh, of our lives, to be able to make decisions and uh, uh, for our future. Uh, you know, this is not a popular thing to say today, right? You know, it's a popular sport nowadays to look for someone or something to blame. Um, no, people very rarely like to look in the mirror and take responsibility uh, for their actions or for their spot in life. Um, you know, we're developing a, a generation of professional victims that, you know, love to be able to point the finger and uh, blame somebody else and not take any responsibility for their own life. Um, and anybody that has been successful does not have that mental model, that mental framework, that mentality. Um, anyone that I've interviewed on this podcast has a, a, an attitude of, I'm going to look in the mirror. I am going to take personal responsibility. I'm going to take agency in my life. I'm going to make decisions. I'm going to go out. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to have discipline and get things done. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that that is uh, what all of us are inspired to do. And we're passing that on to our kids, our grandkids, the people that we work with and constantly digging in uh, to find new, uh, new information that we can find um, to be helpful. So in upcoming episodes, we're going to have a serial entrepreneur who's an attorney uh, who's building a massive law firm in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, by breaking the mold of tradition. Uh, we'll interview a CEO who's found out how to grow algae in deserts around the world to produce supplements and food where people thought this was going to be impossible. We'll speak to a logistics CEO who's revolutionizing his industry, a, a female tech titan out in Silicon Valley who was on the cover of Inc. magazine at a very young age and is known as a unicorn breeder. I'm using those in quote, air quotes, and trust me, this one's going to be amazing. And She's a phenomenal leader. We're going to talk to a uh, Russian national CEO who uh, is in charge of multiple businesses in Russia, and we're going to get his insight and perspective on global issues from behind the front lines in the war in Ukraine. Uh, we're going to talk to an early blockchain and cryptocurrency CEO who's one of the very first people to display a Bitcoin mining rig at Harvard Business School and uh, talk about his insight on the future of blockchain technology and uh, we're going to also talk to another uh, serial entrepreneur who's running hospitals in the Middle East to get his perspective on developments in the uh, Middle East and entrepreneurship and even more. So we're going to continue to bring in uh, just great guests and people that we can all learn from. Um, but, you know, if you couldn't tell, I'm having a blast with these interviews. I'm learning a ton in the, in the process. I hope you are as well. Uh, the comments and suggestions from listeners have been extremely helpful, so uh, keep them coming in. Uh, let me know if there's a topic or industry that you would like covered or a person that you would like to have on the pod, and I'll do my best to see if I can uh, get them uh, on. Now, here's where I'm going to ask for a favor. If you found any of this information to be helpful in your career or you know, things that you're doing in life, I would just ask that you would uh, pass it on to a friend uh, or a colleague. 100% uh, of the growth of this podcast is by word of mouth and friends sharing it with friends. And you heard a story just a, a little bit ago, me telling you, you know, how people are talking about it. And so I thank you for those of you who are out there and you're sharing it uh, within your community. So you passing this along is a really big deal. I know you're using your social capital when you do that. And so I don't take that for granted. And my commitment to you is I'm going to continue to seek the very best uh, folks to interview and hopefully ask a lot of questions and sit back and listen. And hopefully this will be extremely valuable for you, your friends, your kids, uh, coworkers, and so forth. 
Uh, the other thing that I would ask is that this podcast is free. We don't uh, do any advertising on this. And um, so one of the things that I would l love for you to be able to do is if uh, you have an opportunity to go out there and give us a rating on uh, your favorite resource, right? Uh, whether it's on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or rating or a review, that, that greatly helps us as well. So uh, until next time, I hope you're asking a lot of questions yourself with all the various interesting people that you run in, into in your life and you know, seeing what you can learn from them. And uh, I'm sure that you know this, but I'm convinced everybody in life has an interesting story to tell. And if we stop and listen, uh, we've always got great advice and things that we can learn from those individuals. And so hands down, the best education I've ever received in life is the books I've read and the questions that I've asked people that I've met. And I'm going to continue doing that. I hope you will as well. So until our next conversation, I wish you the very best and I'll talk to you soon.